Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the study this morning. Um, as you can see, I'm in a bit of a different location. This is uh, the guitar store, uh, just because the power is off in our building, so I don't have the charts behind me, so I apologize for that. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity we have this morning um, and the resources that we have that we can uh, join one another with your presence online. We take these things for granted, um, but we know that you've given us this time in Earth's history in order to study together. And the things that Satan has done in this world, uh, such as the pandemic, have allowed us um, this opportunity to use Zoom and to study together over the last three years. And so we're very grateful uh, that we can do this. We invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts and into the presence of this meeting, into our minds, that we can understand and comprehend the things that we are studying. And we just ask, Lord, that... Um, as we look at these lines in the book of Judges, that you can give us insight into what we are studying and that this can give us light that we can share with others. Be with each person in their personal struggles and trials. And um, we pray for, the, for health for those that are suffering for health, health problems and issues. Help us to be obedient to the laws of health and to bless us. May your angels watch over each one. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Guess you, you can probably hear those cars outside, uh, car engines. I don't know if you can or not, whether the mic picks it up. Now, the sound's okay? Nothing wrong with the sound? Sound, sound is coming through all right. You're a little lower than what you normally are, but you're coming through fine. Okay, so a little. Yes. Okay, I'm not sure particularly why. I'm using the same microphone. Um, it may just so. be the difference in the way that the other computer is set up. It could be. Um, yeah, it looks like it's, it's all set up properly. The microphone's working. Okay, so <clears throat> a note about yesterday. So yesterday we were... Um, discussing 6666 that is the verse that we were looking at um which was um and here i have to open this up um, the verse we was we're looking at was judges 6 verse 11 and what did we notice about judges 6 11 I mean, Iran had pointed it out. Well, we have the angel under an oak, which is an Ophrah that pertains unto Joash the Abiserite. Yep. And you're going back to the Palmoni site here, so that's interesting. Yeah, so Judges 6 verse 11 is the 6,666 verse of the Bible. Right. Now, we said that this verse uh, can be understood as 11.9. Okay, so we've got it as 11.9, but we also are showing this as the 217th reverse Bible chapter. Yeah, so this chapter is... Um, so uh, does, does that have a significance toward midnight? Now, so it would actually be the 217th Bible chapter. The reverse would be uh, 973. Okay, excuse me. You're right. Yeah. So this is a symbol for midnight. Um, now, the 6666, um, that's the number of days between, Dwight, between you and Iran. Right. And... Um, it's also 
if you uh, take six times six times six times six, which is the same as 36 times 36, it would be the number of days between you were born and I was born, right? So okay. Now, that number is one, two, nine, six. So if you take six times six times six times six, it's one, two, nine, six. And yesterday, there was 1,296 days between yesterday and November 9th, 2019. Interesting. Yes, interesting. Now, now that would be between, so that would be the end of November 9th, 2019 to the beginning of yesterday was 1,296 days, right? So that was, that's what we sometimes call an exclusive count. That is excludes both dates. Now, this, the date study yesterday was um, 361. Now, the day before was study number 360, right? And that one would just be a cardinal count of 12,000, uh, 1,296 days. But, but I think it was very significant because yesterday we were discussing this, right? So, right. So, so to me, that would be um uh, the main point so that was that's kind of an interesting observation i think it was iran who asked me um whether we were talking about it because of that i don't know if it was iran or somebody else on whatsapp i don't have that whatsapp here on this uh, yeah, it was me yeah that was you right and yeah and we weren't right we didn't bring it up for that reason so so he noticed it yesterday after the fact so what we are saying, I mean, one of the things that this does is it, it shows that that we have light for our feet, right? Right. Here, you know, doing a study about something and it happens to be the exact number of days about the date that we're we're saying that this is, which is November 9th, 2019. And it gives us this span of time between that date and the date that we're studying it. And so that completely unintentional. And, and the fact that we didn't really notice it until later, I think, is also important, you know, to recognize. So we're saying that this line um, that we've been studying, this line of Gideon now, and, and also the line of uh, Jeroboam, that they that they're marked the time of the end is marked as November 9th 2019 and and so that's a strong evidence of that and what we talked about with that verse of uh, what it symbolizes so here when we we look at this uh, diagram again we can see that we we have this November 9th and November 9th is a number of things right it's it symbolizes a mighty angel coming down, right? The arrival of the second angel in the line that Jeff has beginning in 1989. But in doing that, we, we recognize that it's, it's primarily the, the empowerment of the first angel, but it's the arrival of the second angel in the sense that 11.9 and 9.11 are the same way mark. So now we're saying that when we zoomed into the arrival of the second angel, which goes from September 11th, um, you know, it starts on September 11th uh, and goes to 2023 in the book of Judges. That is, we're zooming into that way, Mark, when we are talking about it as the arrival of the second angel. And the arrival of the second angel is the Sunday law. And so our line is a zoom into that but we're zooming into that arrival of the second angel. And when we do that, we realize it's more about November 9th, 2019 for our history, for what we are presently in. And so when Jeff was zooming, when he was saying that 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel, he was really creating a new line. He just wasn't aware of that because we didn't really know that you could do that back when he first did this. So now we're looking at this November 9th, and we're saying that 
um, we have this line of Gideon, and this November 9th, can, it can represent September 11th, but there are other things about November 9th. It was a prediction made by Parminder and Tess, and when we addressed it in um, Deborah and Barack, this ends up being a close of probation for them, and, and it becomes this dividing line between the Alpha and the Omega movements. But we also know that a message arrives at 11.9, actually several messages. So one of the messages has to deal with uh, the 273, the two studies on the 273 related to the Mayan calendar. And in that we have the symbol of 144,000 days, which is a back tune and 144,000 um, days as a symbol is the 144,000, of course. And we also have there, we have uh, with the mind calendar, we have 13 of those, which is 1,872,000. And, and there was other things dealing with the mind calendar, the 52 years and, and all these different things um, that we have in 2012. So what's presented, though, in 2019 is the difference between the 391 um, years and, and the difference between uh, the 391 years, which is 142,810 days, uh, that's 12 times 11,900 days and 1,190 hours. The difference between that is 1,190 days. So if you take 142,810 and you add 1,190 days, you get 144,000 days. So this this is very remarkable. This is something that was so profound. It was one of the reasons I believe that we must have uh, that all of the evidence pointed to July 18th, 2020. We had all of these symbols pointing to that, that this would be an attack on the United States by Islam, which it wasn't. Now, we believe that the hand uh, of Islam was stayed by an angel. The winds were held back. There was a restraint that was made. Right, so, so it could have happened had God's people been ready. So when we look at this line of Gideon, though, we know that the, the message of Gideon is about the proclamation of July 18th. And of course, what happens on November 9th is this movement has solidly attached itself to this July 18, 2020 prediction. Tess and Parminder's message has failed. We are there. On November 9th, Jeff is, is clear. This is this message proclamation of July 18th is for our movement. We have Stephen and Odilio there in the School of the Prophets as well as me. It's accepted that this is the message. Many people want Jeff with the failure of November 9th uh, to go back and admit that we were wrong about all this time setting stuff. Just trash everything Parminder did, everything Tess did. But Jeff says, no, this is being led by God. Now, we know that there then is an increase of knowledge. Now, what we have here on, on this is the date March 27th, 2020. So we know that that's the date um, that the 100 days of prayer begin, right? The Seventh-day Adventist Church begins this 100 days of prayer. It's also the day I get technically laid off temporarily because of the pandemic. And we know the symbol there comes from Numbers 3 in Acts 27, the 273. We know it's also the 300, so we can relate the 273 to the 300. The 300 is there in Numbers 3, 22,300. Uh, they use the 22,000 to make the mathematical calculation to show the difference between the firstborn of, of uh, Israel and all of the children of the Levites. And so there's going to be a, um, a ransom made for that. 
And we also saw that this 100, 100 days and the 13 days shows up in Ellen White's Civil War visions. And, and of course, we have the symbol of July 4th, which is the United States, which would refer us back to the Revolutionary Wars, um, which are connected to the Civil Wars. So all of these symbols are tied in here. And the question that we still have to ask, or we still have to answer, I guess we, we've sort of asked it, is what is this darkness and what is this first message that's being represented here with March 27th, 2020 as its formalization and July 4th, 2020 as its empowerment. So we have lots of messages given at 11.9, but the question is what, what is this darkness and what is this message? Can we answer that? So we have the scriptures themselves that 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 we we were going to look at to try to decide um, well exactly which scriptures are applying. We're we're not going to apply all of the scriptures in this story to the line of Gideon. That is, we have other lines where we address specifically uh, the battle. But this one doesn't appear to to address the battle. It doesn't have, um, you know, like we have in the line of Jeroboam, we do have the proclamation of the messages. You know, we have June 21st and 22nd, but here we don't. So where, where, how are we going to take this story of Judges to help us understand what this darkness is in this particular line and what the message is? How are we going to do that? So what is the dream, for instance? Okay, so I'm just going to... So when we look at uh, Judges 7, um, we're going to have this, this dream. He goes down uh, to the camp. Is that relevant to this line at all? I would think yes. Okay, so how would we address it to this line particularly? We're going to talk about that dream that he overhears. Can we attach that to March 27th, 2020? As a formalization of the message. And if so, how? All right. <clears throat> I don't have a direct answer yet. Okay. Okay, so you're looking at the dream in Judges 7. Yep. Now, that's a good comment in the chat. Okay. I don't, I mean, this, to be this as a, a symbol of the first fruits could be interesting, but Well, okay, so we do have the barley loaf. So remember that when we looked at the 144,000 days, Right. And then the, or 144,000 minutes, pardon me, and the 18,720 minutes. So you have those two symbols. And we know that the time that the manna fell, which of course the manna is going to um, 
cease in connection with the first fruit offering right so you're going to have this the first time the wave offering happens is in connection with that day they're going to go out and there's not going to be any manna well that's going to be on a sunday right it's going to be the 16th day of the first month they're going to go out after they've crossed the jordan river and, and that symbol is going to be attached to the number of days that the manna fell which is 14,587 which is uh, 14,400 plus 187. So, so maybe there is some connection there. Okay, Dwight, you had an... Well, I'm looking at this here again, because we've got 713 is the verse where the dream is at. And we know that there are two, two men of the opposition to Gideon, to Israel, that are speaking of this dream. Yeah. Now, a cake of barley bread. Those would we, in in the way that those would have been made, would we have referenced this more like, let's say, a biscuit, or would that have been more like, say, pita bread? Um, well, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, so the idea of a cake is that it's a, the word comes from rolling. So it'd be round. So whether that's round like a pita bread or just like a round loaf. I'm or like sure. a, I mean, right. a lot of biscuits that I've made are also round. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah. So I'd think it's more like a, a loaf of bread, you know, in the way that the old loaves used to be, rather than a flat, flat bread, especially since it's going to, uh, you know, hit the tent and make it fall. Well, see, the, the thing that I'm looking at symbolically yeah. First off, barley was what was more the the common people would eat, right? Yeah, I mean it. It still was the most common uh, sort of grain that they ate. It's more but in, than wheat. In in most cases, this was something that was cooked on a rock. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> We're not talking about something that would rise like a lot of uh, breads that we know today. Yeah, well, the, the breads we have today are actually what mostly people think of as bread is in bakery business, they call it cake bread. Right. Because it's really cake. It's not really bread. <laughs> it, it's it's not like the bread, you know, my mom used to make, uh, which was more bread. These, they have this, all these dough conditioners and everything. It's this light, fluffy stuff. It doesn't really resemble the bread. That we grew up with and it's definitely not the bread of the bible times uh which was you know i mean the breads would be leavened and they would have some rising to soften them but they definitely weren't these fluffy loaves of bread that we have today but i'm looking at this more as something that is of the more of common and i mean my visualization is that if it was something like that of a, almost like a, a pita bread, almost a flat bread, it would be of something that could be seen or thought of as doing very little damage. Yet it tumbles into the host and comes to a tent and, and smites the tent that it falls. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I... It's definitely, I would think, a loaf of bread, not a, not a pita bread. But okay. Uh, but the idea here is it's something very common that comes in, um, and does more damage than you would imagine it would. Right. And so he sees this this loaf of bread rolling into the camp, and it smotes a tent, and then this guy's going to interpret it, of course. Right. Um, but it's intriguing that the interpretation is given within by the enemies. Mm -hmm. So the interpretation is being provided for Gideon's benefit. Yeah. So, so a number of things. We know that he comes down to the camp. He sees 
the, the children of the East lay along the valley like grasshoppers. So we know that's Islam, right? Right. And also their camels are without number. So, so we have all of that uh, attached to it. Correct? Right. So now, now we know that when I come to the 273, it's, it's coming from the prophecy of Revelation 9 connected with uh, the Islamic calendar, or not the Islamic, the Mayan calendar. So I have the Islamic calendar and the Mayan calendar together create this, this 273 symbol. And then I'm saying that this dream, um, that it that it is connected with uh, a message that is it's it's something that's um, that confirms what we're doing, but it's not us that's doing it, right? This whole idea of the pandemic. Remember, Jeff had predicted the pandemic, and then the pandemic happens. And, and the Adventist Church is going to acknowledge this, this pandemic with the 100 days of prayer. And, and the world's going to acknowledge this pandemic, right? Right. So even though it's, it's not really that bad of a pandemic, you know, once we look at it retrospectively as what we feared at the time, definitely it was all taken very seriously by everyone. Now, if we can say that um, that this is interpreted uh, this this way, that this is the sword of Gideon, that the interpretation of this dream, whatever this dream is, in our time, that even those who are not of this movement, those that are of the enemy, are going to acknowledge it's the sword of Gideon. The sword of Gideon is the message of Gideon, right? Right. Okay, and and particularly the message of Gideon regarding July 18. Now, uh, a lot of people accepted July 18, not just in this movement, but out there in the world. There were people who who took seriously uh, the prediction, and have still been affected by it. But there's there's many who who believed that there was a possibility that this was going to happen. So I don't know if particularly how we take this dream, but we know that we have other dreams that are interpreted. Right, so we have the dream of the butler and baker. Again, we have, well, and we have Pharaoh's dream. So we have, I mean, Joseph's dream is really the first dream that we know of, right, in the Bible. No. No, there's another dream that's, I mean, are you going to take uh, Abraham's dream? Well, I was, <clears throat> you're going to Abraham's, but I was also thinking of, of uh, Jacob's dream. Okay, well, Abraham's is first. So, but I'm talking about a prophetic dream that's interpreted. Okay. Right. So Abraham has a dream, but, you know, there isn't an interpretation given to it, per se. It's just his dream. And Jacob has a dream. He sees angels in descending and descending upon the Son of Man or on this ladder, right? But it, which is Christ. But but Joseph is the first one that has a dream, where we see the interpretation of the dream. Correct. Right. Okay. And then we have the butler and baker have a dreams. They'll each have a dream, and it's interpreted. And then we're going to have Pharaoh's dream that's interpreted, right? And so here we have, again, a dream where we have an interpretation of the dream. So this would remind us of Joseph's dream, but also even probably more so the butler and the baker's dream. Right, and the butler and the baker's dream comes in this, the center of this structure, which represents July 18. Right, because remember, Joseph has a dream when he's 17, right? Right. And 11 years later, the butler and baker each have their dreams. So 11 times 17 is 187, yeah. right? 
and then it's a mirror, right? There's going to be 11 years till his dream is fulfilled, and then another 17 years uh, before Jacob <coughs> comes. And also the blessings of the 12 tribes occur. So, so we can see this idea that we have this dream does connect us to the story of Joseph. Now, we could also say it connects us to Abraham, and Abraham gives us the chiasm as well, right? Because that's where we're first going to get that chiasm with the animals that are cut in half. Um, so I'm just saying the fact that we have this dream here, uh, we need to pay attention to it in some way. And we haven't really addressed it in other lines, per se. Right? So here, I think, in the story of Gideon, that this becomes... Um, a representation of a formalization of a message. Does, am, am, I, am I making sense or is this just too arbitrary that I'm going to connect this to March 27th? I think you're making a good point for it. Okay. So anything else? So... So when we look at March 27th, we can see there's this increase of knowledge. And um, now in the line of Joseph, because uh, we really haven't, I mean, we've drawn Joseph's line out. Um, but there is a formalization of the message, is the dream of the butler and the baker, at least it's connected to it. It's connected to this prediction before midnight part of things. So different ways in which I've, drawn out that line. But I just think that that's where we would place this dream with this hundred days commencing. That there is an interpretation of this dream. This relates to, uh, in our line, it relates to this uh, hundred days of prayer because of the pandemic. So even though they're not specifically saying uh, we're accepting July 18th. What the church does in setting up this 100 days of prayer, it confirms what Jeff talks about by the pandemic, because I think it's more important that the church recognize this pandemic than the world did, because this is about this internal line in our relation to the church. And then you have this 144,000 minutes. And then you get to July 4th, this symbol of the United States. And then you have the 13 days, the July 18, 2020 symbol, 18,720 minutes going to July 18, 2020. Um, and, and so the empowerment of that is just the end of the 100 days, right? So we're going to have, and, and maybe we could say mm -hmm. it's the dream and the interpretation are March 27th and July 4th. Or do we look for something else as the empowerment? We could also say that it's, it's you know, uh, when they blow the trumpets or they're called to blow the trumpets or they divide into, uh, you know, these groups. I think the division into the groups and the blowing of the trumpets is, is a July better 4th. symbol. For July 4th. Right. Yeah, okay, because that's what we had yesterday. Okay, so we have this dream and its interpretation, then the 100 days, then we have uh, the blowing of, of the trumpets. And that's going to be July 4th. That's like Rosh Hashanah, right, symbolically, the first, the first day of the civil year. Okay. So what is this message then that, that's being formalized and is being empowered? Because we still haven't really defined what this message is and, and what darkness it is responding to. So what is the real significance of November 9th, 2019 in the context of this line of Gideon? Because we know that darkness comprises many things. I mean, there's Parminder and all that. But this is, is more specific.
is it possible that we could be being called to give a message about the mistrust of the spirit of prophecy that has become so prevalent within the church? Okay, because in the proclamation of of Nashville, now I would say that's more the line of Jeroboam, but because that's going to contain the proclamation. Right, so in the line of Jeroboam, um, you're going to have the June 21st and 22nd symbol there. And, and then you're going to have July 18th. And I would think that this line more addresses that. Right, the warning to Nashville. This this line here of Gideon is not specifically about the warning to Nashville. It's about something something else. Now, of course, we have the church there because it's going to have that hundred days of prayer, and then later it's going to have this ten days of prayer. And and so this this somehow represents the relationship of the Seventh Day Adventist Church uh, to the United States in some way. I mean, the fact that they started this 100 days of prayer on March 27th and they ended on July 4th, right? I mean, you know, even just how that happened, how they chose the date, I mean, it, it's not like they thought it out well in advance, right? Because this this just creeped up on us at, in March. We all of a sudden had all these things happening. And so they just okay, we're going to have 100 days of prayer. And did they even really think about when it's going to end? I don't think so. I, I don't think. I don't think so. I just think they just said, we, we're going to have 100 days, you know. We usually have 10 days of prayer, you know, once in a while, but we're going to have 100 days of prayer. And we're just going to start it, you know, well, whatever it is, you know, right away. I don't think this was announced like a week in advance. I think it was pretty much announced like on March 26th, if I remember correctly, or it was, it was just like, we're just going to have a hundred days of prayer and, and that it happens to fit out in, in this structure with the hundred and the 13, I think is pretty remarkable. So, but, but it's the church that does this. If, if the church doesn't give us the hundred days of prayer, we don't have this structure so, and and that 187 days to january 6th we would have had january 6th but we wouldn't have the 16th and we wouldn't have that 434 days as being marked by anything so that 434 days is important because we know that's the 62 weeks and the 62 weeks if you cut them into half, it'd be 31 weeks, right? 31 weeks, 31 times 7 is 217, the symbol for midnight, right? And we already know that this this verse um, that uh, we're looking at with uh, uh, the Bible indexer, right? Um, it's, it's chapter number, this chapter is chapter 217 so we have the midnight symbol and then this verse is marked out with this 66666 right so that starts that november uh 11th date and so we can say though that this whole this whole um line is connected to that midnight symbol right just because of of where we're starting this line in the verse that we're using to start it <clears throat> So, so the message then is regarding something about the church, because this is about a message to the Levites, right? And, and the way that I looked at it at the time, I said, well, here's an opportunity. We have 100 days of prayer. The people are praying about this. And we need to get a message out to Seventh-day Adventists. That was my thought at the time. And so, of course, we were working on that. We were working on this, this website. And, and we did get the message to the Adventist church. That is, for the first time, 
the Adventist Church has taken notice of this movement. As much as we think that 2520, uh, the church noticed it, it really didn't. Certain conferences did, uh, but the general conference knew nothing about the 2520 proclamation. Even when, um, uh, um, what's his name? The Damsteed, even when he wrote his thing about the 2520, because you could say he's on the Biblical Research Institute or whatever it is, you know, he's part of uh, the conference. I mean, he doesn't really know anything about it. He just, somebody mentions to him, you know, is this, is there anything to the 2520? And he just says no, right? He's not reading any material or making arguments or know who's pro proclaiming it or anything like that. So, so nobody's knows about this, but when it came with the Nashville prediction, um, the church does notice it. And, and from what I understand, my, um, my pastor got contacted by a group. There's sort of all the elite pastors in Adventism who, you know, communicate with each other. And they asked him about me. Um, because they they knew he was the pastor of my pastor, right? And so he says, you definitely got their attention. And and of course the church uh, made a statement about the the ad in the Tennessean as well. So so there's something here when it comes to this hundred days of prayer. Um, we had this opportunity to reach the church, and and we did that to some degree. But when we get to July 4th, uh, the church isn't, you know, definitely there, there's not a lot of people supportive of July 18. So we get to July 4th, we have the symbol of the United States, and then we have these 13 days to July 18. So, so this message then, that, and remember, when you have a message, in order to receive the second message, you have to be benefited by the first. Now, in the other line, we say we knew who was being tested, and it would just be simple to say, well, FFA is being tested. But there's actually somebody else being tested here. This is not really an internal test, right? This is more an external test, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So, because this has to do with the Adventist church, and also, uh, if we look at July 4th, we would have to say that this is also the government. Now, we don't know specifically how much the government knew about this. We know through, through Chuck, because he had connections with the different organizations within the United States. He has friends there. And he said that they, they took this quite seriously. They wanted to know more about it, about this prediction. Um, so, so this would represent that we have both the church involved and also the Seventh-day Adventist church there. And also with the July 4th symbol, we have the United States involved. And any other thoughts then on, on what the darkness is? Is it just the darkness regarding for Adventists regarding the Nashville prediction? That Adventists now become much more aware of this prediction of Nashville? What Ellen White says? Well, they have become aware. Many are still not really wanting to discuss it. Yeah, definitely it's, it's a message that's rejected. Right. Right. So in order to be benefited by uh, the message, uh, the second message, so we're going to have to figure out what that is, you have to be benefited by the first. Now, we know with the second message that this is going to address Nashville being bombed, right? So that's that's huge news. I mean, on Christmas Day to have this bomb go off in Nashville. Um, and that's going to have a, happen 187 days after we publish 
this and there's this reaction to it. Of course, most people aren't going to know that significance of that. And, and then we're going to have this other major event, the Siege of Washington. These, these are two major um, symbols. Right. And, and we can say that, uh, that they are connected to the first message. Because here you have 187 days between July 4th, a symbol of the first day of the first month on the civil calendar for the United States. Right. And then and then you have January 6th, the siege of Washington. Right. This sort of judgment against the United States. Um, any any more thoughts on that, on how that how that gives us information about the darkness? Because we have to so we can say the darkness has to do with the Nashville prediction. Anything else that that darkness has to do with? How would we... How would we understand this? Okay, Rand says Trump. Okay, explain what you mean by Trump. I'm just wondering if it had something to do with him because of the, you have December. 25 and January 6 on there. Okay. So so we have January 6 and what was the other one? You December 25. That? Okay, December 25. Because we have with with what Colin says there. So we have January 6th and December 25th, 2021. Now that's going to be the third message that arrives um, in, in the line of Gideon. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I don't know. I mean, definitely Trump's there at the January 6th because the empowerment there. So if we think about what January 6th is, I mean, it is the siege of Washington, D.C. But what we're primarily marking here is the 10 days of prayer. Right, January 6th to 16th. Now that the 10 days of prayer happens to begin on January 6th is obviously significance. So they had planned this ahead. This, this 10 days of prayer has been, you know, set in place probably for years, right? They, it's just a regular thing they do. But that it happened to fall on January 6th is obviously significant. And it's going to give us that that period of time from the bombing of Nashville to now the bombing of Nashville happens on the biblical calendar on the 10th day of the 10th month. And um, it's going to be the 22nd day of the 10th month which is a symbol for October 22, that the siege occurs. Now, of course, you can see that that's a cardinal count of 12 days, right? But we're saying it's 13 days, an inclusive count. So we're counting all of December 25th and all of January 6th to get the 13 days there. 
but we know that the tenth day of the tenth month is a symbol of the siege because that's the siege begins in 587 BC on the tenth day of the tenth month. <clears throat> so, so what's being, I mean, there's so many symbols here that we could draw out, but we need to know what this, um, we need to know what this darkness is. I mean, we could just say it's the darkness about not understanding about the Nashville prediction, but it has to be more than that. It's not just Nashville. Okay. I mean, the, the point is, when, when we start looking at this in the broad scope. Yeah, okay. Nashville is just the most, you know, kind of the most recent. But I mean, there are so many things that Mrs. White has given counsel on that the church as a whole has remained silent with and upon. There are certain things of diet that they that they just just totally will not accept because they want to be seen more as mainstream with the other churches. Yeah. So this is why you know when you ask the initial question, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, is this not a, <clears throat> a rejection of the counsel of the spirit of prophecy? Well, yes, because it's a rejection of, of Nashville. And that's what I'm saying. It's about the Nashville prediction. But I... I don't think that that's primarily what this line is talking about. It's not just rejection about the spirit of prophecy. I mean, that, that would be part of it, right? And, and, and just a rejection of the Nashville prediction completely, right? So that Nashville prediction has just been ignored by Adventism. And that's going to come to the fore. But, but I see, I was thinking that you would have gone in more the direction about the judgments that are coming upon the United States in general. Because remember, Nashville's just one of the cities that she sees being destroyed, right? You're going to see uh, New York. You're going to see. Well, you're going to see San Francisco, Chicago. Chicago. And New York, right? Those are the main ones. I mean, obviously, New York, we have 9-11. Well, you've got San Francisco, you've got Los Angeles, you've Los got Angeles. Chicago. Chicago, those are the main ones she lists with the fireballs? That's, that's what I recall. Okay, okay. So, so those are the ones with the fireballs. And we can see why with each of those cities. Now, what do each of those cities symbolize? Like if we have those three cities, what do they symbolize? What is what does Los Angeles symbolize? Supposed to be city of angels. <laughs> yeah. It's but it's, name of it. it's also the the city of mindless entertainment. Yeah. So You're entertainment. right. San Francisco? Hollywood and all that's part of it. <laughs> right. San Francisco likes San Francisco is very much like Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. And then what about Chicago? Commerce. Okay. And so, of course, as she had stated, Chicago would be destroyed by a great wind, and Chicago is known as the Windy City. Yeah. Okay. So so we have these destructions. Uh, that are symbolized there by these cities. Um, 
And these are things that are going to come upon the United States. So they're symbols, right? They're not necessary. I mean, obviously those cities exist and they're going to be judged. But they're symbols of, of what the United States is. Sodom and Egypt. Sodom, yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's, uh, it's, it's licentiousness, which would be, you know, of course, um, also related to Sodom, but you know, the, the entertainment and then also commerce, right? We have all of those things. Now, those things are, um, I mean, especially the economics is attacked by the pa pandemic. But these are about the judgments that are coming upon the United States. This is about a warning to the United States. That's what this Nashville prediction is about. And, and if you look at, at what Jeff presents, it is really about this warning to the United States. Oh, there's a bird outside there. Um, just a few feet away from me. Um, so, so this part, this warning of Gideon, because remember, Gideon is um, the empowerment of the first angel on the line of the judges. And so in the line of the judges, we, we, we have here, it's 11-9, that's the empowerment. So this is really specifically about November 9th, Gideon is. And November 9th, even though we we had uh, uh, Sisera, right? Um, um, and whatever the king's name is, Jabin, is it Jabin? Anyway, I always get mixed up with all these names. But anyway, we have the Canaanite king um, and Sisera. There, that is uh, this... Um, attack on this movement by papal ideas that are then going to be countered by this biblical chronology of Deborah and Barak, right? And so then we have this separation that comes. That, that, that is, that's the formalization of that message, right? And then you have 11.9, you have Gideon is, is, is going to defeat this strife the Midianites and so that's what this line of Gideon is about it's about this strife the Midianites are the en enemy but it's a strife between what in this line um, that we're looking at here it's not put so much talking about the strife existing within this movement but about the civil war that exists in the United States so so if we look at the if we look at that if we take the symbol of this civil war in the United States that that is reflected in the civil war in the 1860s we can see all through this history we can see the black lives matters we can see all of these issues that arose during the pandemic um uh, the power of the United States to control us the constitution being challenged all of these are symbolized by July 4th, right? Okay. Right. This is the United States symbol. So we have the Levite symbol and the United States symbol in that first message. So there's something about this that has to do with the message of warning to the church to, to have the Levites prepared to give this message of warning and this message of warning given to the United States. And then we can see in the second angel's message, um, when we look at July 18th, and it's, it's a failed prediction, but it's not really, right? What we expected to happen didn't occur. But when this second angel arrives here, um, what is this specific message then that arrives on July 18th? So we say that we have this message, this first message, and you have to accept this first message to accept the second. And so this message is about 
the United States, it's about Nashville, it's about uh, the warning message to be given to the world, it's about a message to the Levites. And so we get to July 18th, and now we have another message arrive. And you have to have accepted that first message to accept the second message. Now this message is going to be formalized with the bombing of Nashville. And it's going to be empowered with the events of January 6th. But that's connected to the 10 days of prayer. And December 25th, 2020 is a symbol of the siege. So that's a precursor to the destruction that's going to come. And then a third message arrives, right? In order to receive that third message, you have to be benefited by the second message. Or, or in order to be benefited by the third, you have to have accepted the second message. So there's a message that, that we give, but this movement is giving it, but it's also testing, uh, it's testing us as well, because we're part of, of that message. So what arrives on July 18th then that's going to be empowered by December 25th and or formalized on December 25th and empowered on January 6th? So what message arrives? And what verses are we going to use to do that? So we got we got the dream over here. Right. Um, so if we go here, we're going to put um, also the dream, right, we're going to say that that's there. And then here we're going to say that this is the trumpets. Um, the blowing of the trumpets. I should put here seven. 13 and the trumpets are going to be um I believe it's 18 okay why 713 what isn't that the dream well i'm i'm just making sure i mean we're we're addressing this from judges yeah so judges 713 so we just put the chapters and verses in judges that we're looking at okay to to deal with that so that's why we put those in there and then we're going to have these trumpets um that's going to be verse 18. so this is warning about what's going to happen 13 days later right so that's going to be uh, 7 18. <clears throat> Now it's also, oops, uh, it's also um, then the trumpets is announcing the Day of Atonement, right? So January 6th. Um, so it's also connected with the empowerment. So the empowerment of the first is connected with the empowerment of the second. So then on uh, July 18th, we have a message arrive, and the verses uh, that we're going to use for that, um, we're going to take from chapter, uh, are we going to take that from chapter 8? Because here in this story, we're not going to deal with the battle itself. We're not dealing with Oreb and Zeb, um, or Zeba and Zelmuna specifically. At least that's how we were looking at it before. Yeah. So if we look at chapter eight, so we're, we're just going to look ahead at chapter eight and see where we would, what we would do with this and how it would fit with these different waymarks. So we're going to have the men of Ephraim. 
The men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus that thou calledest not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Horeb and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, he and the three hundred men that were with him, faint yet pursuing. Now, I would take 8 verse 4 as the arrival of this new message. It says they're faint yet pursuing. Yeah. Faint yet pursuing. But I'm taking passing over the Jordan as the symbol so why would i do that why would i put that at july 18 as the arrival of the second message so i'm just going to say here i'm going to say crossing the jordan um is going to be uh this way mark i know you can't see what i'm doing here. putting that under july 18. Okay, so, so they're crossing the Jordan. Why would I put the crossing of the Jordan at the arrival of the second angel? Like, why would I put that at July 18? Okay, anybody? Why would I put it there? They put crossing Jordan. So they're going to cross the Jordan. That's going to be July 18. That's the arrival of the second angel. Would that be to signify the acceptance of the validity of, of spirit of prophecy? Okay. Well, it's the accepting of the message. It's a baptism, right? Right. So, you know, if we get to July 18... You know, blessed is he that cometh to the 1335, you know, that type of thing. Uh, there receives a blessing there. Now, we, we can say that when we when we put this line, we can say the second angel is 9-11, right? That's baptism, and then you got midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law, in a, this bigger line. Um, but we're going to say that this is the, the crossing of the Jordan. This is a type of baptism. It is, we're benefited by the first message. We're faint yet pursuing. So even though um, we're faint because of the, the failure of the prediction, we're still pursuing. We're still taking this message. And, and, and in this context, we're, we're not looking at the fact, you know, dealing with, the, with what's happening with, the, with Ephraim, with the men of Ephraim at this point in this line. We're just taking the fact that the 300, and and that, that's an important part of this, it's the 300 who are crossing Jordan. Does that make sense? And, and, and especially in the context that Jeff had talked about, it's the 300 that are left. And in the story I of Gideon... Not yeah. just the 300 that are left in the study, in the story of Gideon, but the 300 that gave the message during the Millerite time. Right. So, so you're going to have uh, the 300 preachers, right? Right. This is the second angel. Now, of course, they gave that as well because we see the 300 earlier. But we have the 300 here. This is the proclamation of October 22, right? That's going to begin... Uh, with the failure of Miller's prediction. So now we have this 300 crossing the Jordan. And and that's uh, Judges 8, verse 4. So we have the symbol of 84. That's 
um, 12 times 7 is 84. So that's symbolized there. Uh, the midst of the week, right, sort of thing. Anyway, uh, the week of Christ and 25, 20, all those things are symbolized here. So we get to July 18th. This is the culmination of everything that Jeff had um, in his message. Now, Jeff is not going to continue past July 18th. So, you know, if you're just taking this fractalized line, you know, Jeff is there from November 9th to July 18th, but he's not going to be there from July 18th to December 25th, 2021. But the group that's being tested here is not particularly FFA. And, and the remnant of FFA in this line. I'm not sure really how to define the groups that are being tested. But I do know that you have Jeff before, but you don't have Jeff after. Now, in the story, you're going to have the message of Gideon, because the message of Gideon is the message of July 18, and it's going to cross the Jordan. It's going to pursue uh, Zeba and Zalmunna. Um, and in Judges 8, verse 5, so let's go and read more of this here. And he said unto the men of Sukkoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. So he's going to ask the men of Sukkoth, or the princes of Sukkoth, right? And and then uh, then also the, the men of Penuel. Now, we know that Sukkoth refers to booths, right? Correct. And Penuel, this references basically um, uh, like, well, the face of God, right? That's, that's where that comes from. Okay, right. so this, this is the face of God. So you got... You got booths and you got the face of God. Now, now we have made an application of these to be uh, these groups, right? So, so we've made an application of this in in other lines. Um, so, whether we're going to make an application here in this line of Gideon, uh, we could, right? So. Just not sure how how we do that, um, but uh, this is going to be about uh, pursuing the men of uh, or the Zeben Zalmuna and the lack of support. So we looked at that before with the different groups, the American and Canadian group, and events that happened. So we did that in another line, but they could represent something else in this line. And then you're going to have Gideon's ephod, and then you're going to have uh, the death of Gideon, right? So you're going to have have that in chapter eight. So if we were going to to address these, um, could we could we put um, any of these at December twenty fifth or January sixth? as symbols. Because you would have to have booths. Let's say you put booths at December 25th, Succoth. And you put the face of God, Penuel, at January 6th. Would that make sense? Now, you also have the destruction of these people, right? 
So, so what would Sukkoth and Penuel represent in this line? So remember, they're going to pursue, right? And and then verse six, and the princes of Sukkoth said, "Are the hands of Zeb and Zamuna now in thine hand that we should uh, give bread unto thine army?" Right. So the princes of Sukkoth said, "You haven't defeated the enemy. Why should we support you?" And Gideon said, therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeban Zalmunna into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And he went up thence unto Penuel and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered him. And he spake also unto the men of Penuel, saying, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Could we take the bombing of Nashville as represented... Uh, by the judgment against the men of Sukkoth? And could we take June, January 6th as the judgment against the men of Penuel? And if we do, what are they representing? Or are we going to take, you know, what happens to Ziba and Zalmunna itself representing these events? Because remember Ziba and Zalmunna, what did we have them represent? Does anybody remember? <clears throat> they represented messages. What messages? Would those be <clears throat> messages that were accepted within the movement? Okay. Um, no, they're messages that are still, they're, they're messages that come after July 18. But I mean, we're talking about messages that are, that are antithetical to the message of July 18. Antithetical. Well, they're not in agreement. Okay, so we had them uh, symbolize um, the message of Odilio and Colin. Right. Right, and that is Odilio's was about July 18, but he related his to the mandates. And Collins was about Trump, right? Correct. So if we were to put, um, this here, that this is going to be Sukkoth, this is then, um, the message. of Odilia's message that deals with with Nashville, right? And that is, that message is a message that needs to be pursued by the 300 who crossed the Jordan. And, and, and it's not a fault message. See, I, I don't know if I would say it's antithetical. See, the problem is that what Colin and Odilia present is truth. So their message, that is, the arguments that they are making do not 
actually lead to the conclusion that they come to, right? That is, Odilio makes these arguments for the validity of July 18, but his conclusion is we need to support Collins' Trump prediction, which, which doesn't follow from anything that he presented. It doesn't track at all. Yeah. And then Colin, he has this light regarding Daniel chapter 3, and Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, and Revelation 17. But again, even though he's right about his his connection of these verses and some of what he says, the conclusion doesn't follow. Now, it doesn't follow for Colin, mostly because he doesn't understand the lines. And that's partly true with Odilio. So Odilio wasn't really studying or following things. He ended up getting a job and he was too busy, he told me, right, to really study everything that we were doing. Um, so he's unaware of most of what we found, especially in examining the foundation. So is Colin. So when we went through that history and we, we looked at how Jeff had, had applied Millerite history, we looked at the mistakes of Millerite history and we could see the parallel to the mistakes that we had made. That is, what it is that we didn't understand correctly that was leading us to make errors. And um, so both Odilio and Colin, if they had, um, if they had seen what we saw, right, if they had understood this, uh, things would have been quite different, right, in, in what they drew as conclusions. So I could see that they didn't see this. I could recognize, okay, if they, if they could see what I was seeing, if they could understand how the lines worked, they would see way more in what they were presenting than, than was there, but they couldn't see it. And I tried to help them to see it. They took it as an attack. Well, I don't know if Adilio took it as an attack, um, but I definitely know Colin took it as an attack. So he felt that I should just accept his conclusion, even though it doesn't follow, right? And so we got these two. So it's not here so much the messages, though, but I believe that December 25th, 2020, um, what, what is the judgment that's going to come to the men of Sukkoth? I will tear your flesh with thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Right. Can we connect that to the bombing of Nashville? Symbolically, that's possible. Yeah. Um, so the word tear... Um, to trample or thresh. Um, and then the thorns uh, in the sense of pricking. And these are the thorns of the wilderness that is driving, that is open field where the cattle, cattle are driven. Uh, by implication, a desert also speech, including desert south speech wilderness. And, and with briars, um, a thorn, perhaps a burning burning brightly. So we could see that that bomb going off in that motorhome could be symbolized this way, right? I mean, we're kind of taking it somewhat literally, but we're just saying that, you know, this, this happened and, and this fulfilled as a type or as a symbol of what was going to happen to Nashville.
Now, also, what's the significance of it happening on Christmas Day? I mean, besides from the fact that December 25th, 2021 was the end of our line. So it's going to happen uh, 365 days before the end of our 777 structure. Uh, what's the significance of December 25th? Depending on how you write that out, you could be eight away from 2520. Um, Just an odd comment. Okay, uh, what do you mean by that? Well, if you're writing out the date, in the American way, it would be 1225. In the European manner, it would be 2512. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. 2512. Well, I'm not thinking so much of the symbol of the number of December 25th. I'm just thinking about what December 25th represents. So we know it's, it's the false day for the birth of Christ. And Jesus isn't born December 25th, but it's Christmas. It's, it's the day that people celebrate as the birth of Christ. So, I mean, the fact that it happens on a Christmas Day is pretty shocking. Of course, there's not a lot of people around Christmas Day um, in, in, in Nashville, in sort of a downtown area type of thing, right? Right. Um, which is probably why he chose that. I don't think he wanted to kill a bunch of people. I don't really fully understand what his motive was. Uh, it's hard to know based on what the media told us. It seems like a lot of speculation. But, <clears throat> you know, we have, uh, what's the first December 25th date we have in history? We have Clovis's baptism in 508. What else do we have in December 25th? So we got Clovis's baptism. You got my baptism. Anything else? In the chat, Iran says USSR. Okay, yeah, so you're going to have the end of the USSR in 1991. Okay. I know there's some other events. I know there's some um, uh, let me see. I got uh, different um, so it, Clovis is baptized in 508 but the coronation of Charlemagne as Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor in Rome that's in 800 um, Pope Pius the, the fourth is elected four months before his predecessor's death. Um, we got Halley's Comet uh, cited by Johann Georg uh, Palitz, however you say his last name, confirming Edmund Halley's prediction. That's in 1758. Um Um. 
Hmm. And there's, there's lots of events that happen on December 25th through history. Which ones are uh, pertinent? Well, it's kind of interesting the James Webb uh, Space Telescope is launched in 2021. Um, I don't know if we ever really paid attention to that. I do because of astronomy, but that was on uh, Christmas too. That was yeah, Christmas Day. That's December what I'm saying. Launched, These are all right? Christmas, so yeah. So they're gonna um, yeah, that's a... yeah do that on Christmas Day. I'm not sure why they decide to launch it on Christmas Day. But anyway, we have all of these events on December 25th. The Nashville bombing of Nashville is mentioned. Um, so what is... So we have Sukkot there. And we have this 13 days before Penuel. So we have this July 18, 2020 symbol. Anything else? I think it's, this is going to take something that we're going to have to mull over for a bit. Yeah, probably, you know, we need to, we need to take some thought on this, but now I'm putting Sukkoth and Penuel there. Um, because I do think they fit. Now, Penuel, of course, is the tower, right? So if we look at, at the judgment given against the men of Penuel, he's going to tear down their tower, right? Right. Um, break, I'll break down this power, our tower, pardon me. So when I come again in peace, I'll break down this tower. Um, so could this tower at all... Uh, represent what happens to the United States on January 6th, the breaking down of the tower. Could very possibly. The word uh, breakdown means tear down, beat down, cast down, destroy, overthrow, pull down, throw down. And of course we know the tower is Migdal, right? A castle, a flower, a pulpit, a tower. Okay, so, and we know that um, the Democrats defeat Trump there, right, on January 6th. So these, these events, the 10 days of prayer, the 100 days of prayer, they mark these important dates. Now, the end of this 10 days of prayer course, we have the 434 days. Okay, so we're going to have to come back to this uh, tomorrow. I'll be back in my regular studio. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? None from me. Okay. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the study here this morning that we could have it. And uh, we pray for each person, bring us together again uh, to study your word. And this is our prayer, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.